Okay, um, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and uh, I wanted to first of all, thank the uh, organizers for their uh, invitation. So uh, in this talk, I wanted to talk about how we can uh, use spin hall phenomena as a new probe of uh, various types of quantum magnets. And I wanna focus in particular on quantum spin liquids and uh, so uh, essentially all of uh, what I'm going to talk about is contained in these two uh, references here. So now let me, all right. So let me start off by uh, acknowledging my collaborators. Uh, most of this work was done in collaboration with uh, my graduate student, uh, Joshua Aftergood. Uh, and uh, some of this work was also done in collaboration with Andreas Schneider and uh, Darshan Joshi from Max Planck Institute in Stuttgart. And I also want to uh, acknowledge some uh, local funding from uh, City University of uh, New York. Okay, so here's the brief uh, outline of my talk. Uh, I wanna first start off by introducing this idea of spin hole noise uh, spectroscopy. And uh, I wanna uh, apply this technique to probe uh, two different types of uh, quantum magnets. Uh, first one is a quantum spin ladder system and I'll talk about how this technique is useful for de uh, detecting topological phase transitions in this uh, quantum spin ladder. Uh, and then in the second part of the talk, I wanna apply this technique to uh, quantum spin liquids, various types of two-dimensional uh, quantum spin liquids, uh, and talk about how this technique can be useful in detecting spin density of states uh, uh, of these materials. So I'm gonna be focusing on three different types of uh, quantum spin liquids, a spin a half Kagome Heisenberg antiferromagnet, which may be a relevant model for this mineral compound. Also talk about the antiferromagnetic Kitaev honeycomb model, and also a spin on Fermi surface, which is coupled to a gapless U1 gauge fluctuations, which may be relevant for certain organic salt compounds, as well as uh, this ytterbium magnesium compound, which was uh, recently discovered. Um, and I'll give a brief summary and outlook uh, at the end. So uh, spin hole phenomena was actually introduced very nicely by uh, the first speaker of the session, Rembert. So I'm just gonna briefly go over uh, one aspect of it that uh, is sort of behind uh, the inspiration behind our, our, our spin hole noise uh, spectroscopy. It's basically spin hole magneto resistance uh, and the spin hole magneto resistance uh, is a correction to longitudinal and hall resistivities of a strongly uh, spin orbit coupled metal when it's in contact with a magnetic material. So the type of system uh, that we're, that's of interest here uh, is very similar to what was introduced by Rembert. Uh, basically you have a magnetic insulator which is interfaced by metal with strong spin orbit coupling. And imagine that you're doing uh, an electrical conductivity measurement through this metal. So there's a current flowing this way by spin hall effect that generates a spin current that's perpendicular to this interface with uh, polarization, uh, let's say along the Y direction. Uh, and depending on uh, the relative orientation of this magnetization relative to that polarization, different amounts of spin current can be absorbed by the ferromagnetic insulator uh, by spin transfer cloak. And the modulation in that uh, absorbed spin current by changing the orientation of that magnetization leads to modulation in the electrical uh, conductivity through this metal uh, by inverse uh, spin hull effect. And this is what was exactly ob uh, observed in these kind of experiments here, where if you have, um, if you change the, uh, uh, let's say the orientation of this magnetization is parallel to uh, the spin polarization here, a minimal amount of spin current is absorbed by the magnetic insulator, which leads to a minimum in the magneto resistance uh, however, when the magnetization is oriented uh, normal to the spin polarization, uh, that leads to a maximum in the magneto uh, resistance. Um, there's another way to understand this phenomenon from a completely equilibrium point of view, and that uses fluctuation dissipation theorem. So uh, one could uh, look at this uh, setup, the same kind of setup, a magnetic insulator coupled to a, a normal metal, and instead of measuring the conductivity through the normal metal, you're actually measuring the voltage noise uh, that's uh, measured across and uh, along this uh, axis. Then by fluctuation dissipation theorem, uh, the, uh, the, the resistance through this normal metal should be strictly related to the uh, voltage equilibrium uh, voltage noise that's measured uh, inside this normal metal. And this was what was uh, exactly done by uh, this paper here which includes Akash as well as the speaker of the next uh, talk. 
Uh, and basically here, uh, what they measured was the voltage noise, uh, the DC voltage noise as a function of uh, the magnetic orientation relative to this axis here. And they see exactly the same kind of oscillation in the noise. And so that basically is telling us that uh, this magneto resistance is proportional to this uh, voltage noise, the DC component of the voltage noise by fluctuation dissipation term. So this was sort of a inspiration behind our work. Uh, and we wanted to generalize uh, that kind of setup to uh, a magnetic material, uh, insulating magnetic material with no long range magnetic order, uh, just a generic quantum magnet. And we're considering a bilayer setup here where you have a metal which is in contact with a quantum magnet. Every, this entire system is in uh, thermodynamic equilibrium. And we're interested in this uh, noise inside uh, this normal metal. And uh, even though this whole setup is in equilibrium uh, due to thermal and quantum fluctuations inside this quantum magnet, that's going to generate uh, uh, fluctuating spin current right at this interface. And by inverse spin Hall effect, that leads to fluctuating voltage uh, signal inside the metal. And the idea is that if we look at the, uh, so not just looking at the DC component, but if we actually try to look at the entire voltage noise power spectral density uh, inside the metal, maybe we can learn something about uh, this, uh, uh, the spectral properties of this quantum magnet. So generically, what we would expect is that there is a component in the uh, voltage noise, which is intrinsic to the metal, which is there even in the absence of the quantum magnet. And then there is a correction uh, to the noise, which is coming from the presence uh, of this uh, quantum magnet. And so uh, what we're gonna be interested in is this uh, additional correction that is arising uh, due to the presence of this uh, quantum magnet. And that would serve as sort of a new probe uh, of this, uh, the properties of this uh, insulating material. Okay, so uh, the, due to the directionality uh, of inverse spin Hall effect, uh, the interfacial Z polarized spin current fluctuations, uh, which I denote by S sub S here, uh, generates voltage fluctuations along the Y direction inside the metal. And what we're gonna do uh, in our assumption here is that uh, we're just simply gonna assume that the voltage noise power spectral density that uh, one can measure electrically is proportional to this uh, interfacial spin current noise right at this uh, interface, okay? With a sort of a phenomenological constant that converts the noise into uh, spin noise into voltage noise. So the task left for us to do is to theoretically calculate uh, what is this interfacial spin current noise? Uh, and so we're just gonna treat the metal using the usual Sommerfeld model. Uh, we're gonna assume an exchange coupling at the interface uh, and we're gonna define the spin current to be, uh, the interfacial spin current to be the total Z polarized spin that's entering uh, the metal. And what we find is that you could calculate the interfacial spin current noise as sort of an integral over the dynamical spin structure factor, local dynamical spin structure factor uh, right at this interface for this uh, quantum magnet. And so uh, basically the measurable voltage noise correction uh, inside the metal is proportional to the imaginary part of this dynamical spin structure factor of the adjacent quantum magnet. Uh, and, the, and so far in this calculation, there was no assumption about a specific Hamiltonian for this uh, quantum magnet. Uh, all the information about that quantum magnet is hidden inside this uh, spin structure factor. So uh, the remaining task then is to calculate this spin-spin uh, correlation function for various types of quantum magnets that uh, one might be interested in in probing. Um, in terms of measurement, uh, there are a couple of ways to sort of measure our predictions. Uh, one way is to measure uh, the voltage noise directly uh, and assuming that the background sort of noise and the metal is known. So this is the intrinsic noise uh, of the metal in the absence of the quantum magnet. Assuming that is known by taking the difference between the noises uh, that would uh, verify our uh, prediction for the voltage noise correction. Another way to measure it is through um, AC resistance measurement. So one can do an AC resistance measurement uh, through, the uh, through this normal metal Again, if one knows the, the AC resistance of the metal uh, in the absence of the quantum magnet, difference should give rise to this additional uh, voltage correction. Okay. 
So I want to apply this idea to a couple of different types of systems. Uh, one is, first one is a quantum spin matter system. And this is a system that has been considered by my collaborators, uh, Andrea Schneider and Darshan Joshi, in the context of topological phase transitions and quantum magnets. So they looked at this uh, uh, quasi one dimensional quantum spin ladder system uh, described by this Hamiltonian here. Basically, we have an intra dimer uh, exchange J, there's an inter dimer exchange K, uh, there's Jalsinski Mori interaction, uh, and there's an magne external magnetic field that's applied along uh, the Y direction. The dominant uh, interaction in this material, uh, in this uh, system that they considered, is this intra dimer uh, exchange J. And so this lead the ground state of this system is a dimerized quantum antiferromagnet. Uh, and uh, the low lying, low energy excitations above this ground state are three gapped uh, excitations or spin one triplons, which are basically created by breaking these uh, singlet uh, dimers. Uh, and if we look at the uh, bulk property, the bulk uh, triplon band structure for this uh, quantum spin ladder, one finds that there is a uh, quantum phase transition happening when the magnetic field is exactly equal to, magnitude of the magnetic field is equal to the jalousinski mori interaction strength in the system. And so as the magnetic field tunes through the jalousinski mori interaction, here's magnetic field at negative D, uh, one enters a topologically non-trivial phase. And then there's again, uh, emerges out of that topologically non-trivial phase when the magnetic field is equal to positive. Uh, Jalouskinski Mori interaction strength. And if we solve this uh, triplon, if, uh, if you solve this uh, triplon band with open boundary conditions, then one finds that uh, in this topologically non trivial phase, uh, there is one, uh, an edge state that appears at the end of this quantum spin matter, which is exponentially localized at the end. So this is a plot of the local uh, spin density, sorry, uh, spin density of states. Uh, in the quantum spin ladder right at the end. And we find it, and, and the, uh, the presence of this uh, state right in the middle uh, between the upper and the lower triplon bands actually give rise to an exponentially localized uh, state at the end of the quantum spin ladder. And the idea is that a spin hall noise spectroscopy is particularly sensitive to changes in the density of states at the ends of quantum magnets. So it's, it's, it's useful for probing the emergence of this topologically protected edge state. So that's what we looked at. So imagine that uh, we, we have a contact here between the quantum spin ladder uh, with a, a, a metal with strong spin orbit coupling. And, uh, and, and this, uh, the, the voltage noise spectrum here is going to be particularly sensitive to changes in the local spin structure factor, spin spin correlation function right at the end of this uh, quantum spin ladder. And that's what's plotted here. This is a spin, spin correlation function right at the end of the spin ladder. Uh, in the topologically trivial phase, there's just really uh, broad features at frequency scale equal to the exchange J of that system. However, in the topologically non-trivial phase, uh, sharp features start to appear uh, right at that uh, frequency scale. Okay. Uh, and uh, if we then calculate the noise, which is basically the frequency integral over that spin-spin correlation function, uh, in the topologically trivial phase, you'll feed, uh, you'll, this is sort of a cartoon illustration, but you'll, you'll see that there's small, very small changes in the slope of the uh, voltage spectrum. Uh, but in the topologically tri non-trivial phase, uh, you'll see a sudden change in the slope, uh, basically coming from integrating over this peak, here, uh, this very strong peak that emerges. Uh, in the, the non-trivial phase. So this is, uh, this is particularly useful for probing uh, this topological phase transition. And one candidate material that was put forth by uh, Andreas and his collaborator was this bismuth copper material, which seems to be one realization of this quantum spin ladder model. Uh, one pro possible difficulty is that, uh, one you know, most likely di difficulty is that uh, the edge states, uh, of course, these are bosonic systems, so the edge states occur at finite energy, uh, and uh, there the uh, frequency scale at which these sharp features start to appear are in, in the 100 gigahertz range, uh, which means that uh, a high frequency noise spectral analyzer will be needed in that range to uh, detect uh, the topological phase transition. 
But uh, this idea can be carried for, for, uh, for, uh, forward for many types of uh, uh, topologically, uh, top, non topologically non-trivial quantum magnetic phases that have been proposed over the last several years. Uh, uh, again, this kind of noise spectroscopy is particularly useful for the emergence of these edge states. Uh, and so it could be generalized to many different types of uh, topologically non-trivial quantum magnetic phases. So now I also want to talk about uh, how this technique may, may be useful for probing spectral properties of various types of quantum spin liquids. And so uh, first model that I considered is a Kagome uh, quantum antiferromagnet. Uh, the simplest uh, realization of that is just this nearest neighbor spin-spin interaction, uh, Hamiltonian here, Heisenberg Hamiltonian, uh, where the spins reside on the vertices of a two-dimensional Kagome lattice. Uh, and there has been quite a bit of theoretical work looking at the ground state of this Hamiltonian, uh, but I think the state of the art uh, DMRG studies seem to suggest that this quantum spin liquid is in a fully gapped state where the spins and the gauge fluxes are completely gapped out at low energies. Um, so uh, one particular uh, a nice analytical model to model this gapped quantum spin liquid is a Z2 gapped quantum spin liquid model put forth by Reed and Sachdev a few decades ago. Uh, and basically the idea here is that the spin is, uh, is uh, represented in terms of these Schwinger bosons, which leads to a strongly interacting bosonic model. But uh, they studied this model within the mean field theory, uh, which is, is, is particularly nice in describing a quantum phase transition between this Z2 gapped quantum spin liquid phase and a magnetically ordered antiferromagnetic state. So, um, and this uh, mean field uh, version of this Hamiltonian has been studied quite carefully more recently by uh, size the evidence collaborators in 2016. And they show that there's quite a good uh, agreement in the inelastic neutron data between this model and what is measured in this experiment. So we're gonna be using the mean field parameters that were uh, determined from uh, fitting this uh, data uh, from this paper for our study here. Okay, so what we're interested in is a two-dimensional quantum spin, Z2 quantum spin liquid here, two, uh, which is coupled to a metal. And I'm interested in the voltage noise correction that arises due to this quantum spin liquid. Uh, and uh, here again, we're, we just have to calculate this spin-spin correlation function for uh, the quantum spin liquid. And that, that's done here uh, numerically, has quite a, a sharp features, uh, which is basically the spin density of states uh, of this uh, quantum spin liquid. At low energies, there's an, a, a suppression in the density of states because this is a gapped uh, system. So due to the spin gap, this leads to suppression in the density of states at low energies. So once we integrate this over to get the uh, voltage noise correction, uh, we'll see an Arrhenius law-like uh, dependence at low energies, an exponential suppression, where uh, the exponential, uh, the energy scale, the setting that suppression is basically given by the spin gap. So, uh, the noise uh, spectrum is particularly useful in quantifying uh, the spin-on gap of this uh, quantum spin liquid, which is uh, uh, will be a nice contribution, I think, to the to the field. Another model we looked at is a spin-on Fermi surface coupled to a U1 gauge field, and this this model may be particularly useful for uh, uh, quantum magnets on a on a two-dimensional triangular lattice. And so the type of model was studied by Patrick Lee, Nagaosa, and uh, Pochinsky uh, a few decades ago. Uh, and uh, this, this is a model where we have a spin-on um, spin on excitations, which are basically metal me metallic-like uh, excitations. And these spin excitations are coupled to U1 uh, gauge field. Uh, and uh, this model uh, may be, again, relevant for this two-dimensional uh, triangular lattice materials because there they see the linear uh, low temperature uh, specific heat, linear temperature, low temperature specific heat, and also metal-like thermal conductivity, even though this, met, uh, this material is electrically insulating. So there might be some relevant relevance for these materials. Uh, and so if we calculate, uh, calculating the local dynamical spin structure factor amounts to calculating uh, this uh, correlation function. Uh, and, and at lowest order, you have basically this bare bubble which is uh, 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 the spin structure factor in the absence of corrections due to the gauge field. 
Uh, and then these are the gauge field corrections to two loop order. And if we calculate this, uh, what we find is that uh, uh, there is a omega Q scaling in the noise power spectral density, which is uh, uh, indicative of gapless spin excitations. But then there's a subleading correction with a four thirds power that comes in, uh, which is an indi indication of the coupling of these spin-ons to the gapless U1 uh, gauge field. Uh, and so these sort of power laws uh, are signatures uh, of uh, this kind of ground state. And then finally, in the last couple of minutes, I wanna talk about the Kitaev honeycomb model, um, which, uh, which is particularly nice because it's an exact, exactly solvable model of a quantum spin liquid. So basically we have spins residing on the vertices of a honeycomb lattice, uh, and these bonds are uh, flavored. So uh, on the X flavored bond, uh, spins on the ends of this X flavored bond, only, inter only the X components of those spins uh, interact with a uh, coupling constant Kx. And on the Y bond, only the Sy components interact with the Ky constant and so on for the Z bond. Uh, the, the phase that we particularly focused on is, is the gapless uh, phase of this model uh, where uh, Kx, Ky, Kz are e all equal to each other. Actually, we're in this region B where uh, the gapless quantum spin liquid phase is uh, found. And there you can actually map this model to a gapless Majorana Dirac fermions, which are hopping on the honeycomb lattice. Basically, it just becomes a very simple model of a, a free Majorana gas uh, moving in a static background gauge potential. Uh, and this problem actually is, uh, um, it's a calculating the spin correlation function. Uh, it, it, it involves uh, creating a Majorana fermion at site J but at the same time, uh, creating a spin excitation, actually at the same time as creating the Majorana, you actually need to create two uh, flux, gauge flux potentials at, at these two plaquettes. So it's really a quantum quench problem in which the Majorana fermions uh, rearrange themselves in the sudden appearance of this flux potential, gauge flux potential. So it's a, um, you're looking at the propagation of Majorana fermions in the presence of this uh, flux potential that suddenly appears in time. Um, but it was noted by uh, this work uh, in 2014 that uh, this correlation function can be very well approximated uh, in the adiabatic approximation in which the flux potential is turned on in the infinite past uh, and then slowly turned off in the infinite future. Then you can use uh, time translation invariant um, field theory to calculate uh, these correlation functions. And that's what we did. Sorry. Here. And that's what we did here. Um, so again, we have this Kitaev honeycomb model here coupled to this metal. Uh, and the spin structure factor uh, is given by uh, this plot here. And although this phase is actually gapless in the spin sector, uh, the gauge fluxes are gapped, the flux excitations are gapped. And what that means is that, uh, and because the spin, ex every spin uh, correlation function involves creating a Majorana as well as the gauge fluxes, the spin spin correlation function actually uh, exhibits a uh, gapped uh, behavior as well. So this gap actually shows up in the no noise spectrum as well. Uh, there's going to be an exponential suppression at uh, low frequencies. Um, uh, and, and this uh, suppression, the exponential dependence can be used to extract the two flux potential, uh, the energy needed to create the two fluxes um, um, in, the, in the model. So, and that basically is about 25% uh, of the Kitaev coupling uh, scale. Okay, so I just wanted to end there. Um, so uh, I introduced this idea of a spin hole noise spectroscopy as possibly useful probe of various types of quantum magnets via voltage fluctuations using inverse spin hole effect. Uh, one example I looked at was using this technique to probe topological phase transition in quantum spin ladder. And another uh, possible route is to use this as a probe of spin density of states, the spectral properties of various types of quantum spin liquids. And it will be a great test uh, to test QSL models against real candidate uh, materials. Um, and as just possible future directions, one of the things we're looking at is more sort of microscopic conversion mechanism of this noise uh, spectrum 
to voltage noise. Uh, we shoved all that conversion into this constant here, but we're looking at the details of how that conversion actually happens and the frequency dependence uh, of that conversion uh, and so on. And we can also test these models with different other, other types of uh, quantum spin liquid models that are available. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention.